Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first in a series of interviews we're holding in the run-up to this year's Outlook, which, organised by Adana, is known as the world's premier non-wovens hygiene, personal care and wipes products conference. My name is Hayden Davis, and I'm the editor here at Sustainable Non-wovens. Um, we're a media partner with Adana, and we're working closely together to bring you a sneak preview of what you can expect at this year's event. As I'm sure most of you know, Outlook will take place online from April 21st to 23rd, and to date has more than 30 speakers lined up offering a diverse range of panel discussions and topical presentations. Today, though, it's my pleasure to welcome Robert Ward, who will be a keynote speaker, I think, on the opening day of the conference. Uh, Robert is the Japan Chair, Director of Geoeconomics and Strategy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, thank you again for joining us, Robert. Perhaps first, I could ask you to just briefly outline the work carried out by the IISS. Well, th thank you for that introduction and thanks for having me. Um, the IISS's core mission is to promote the development of sound policies to promote, uh, support international peace and security. Um, its core expertise is in defence and international relations. And my area of uh, focus is in, is in geoeconomics, which is basically, very crudely put, the overlap between economics and uh, geopolitics. Right. OK, thank you. Um, Robert, it's, it's fair to say that the world is a very different place from 2019, which is when you last addressed the Outlook conference. Um, can you briefly outline the issues you'll be addressing when the event reconvenes in April? Yes, October 2019 in Athens seems a very long way away uh, now yes. and uh, the pandemic has definitely been a, a structural break for global politics and, and economics. So uh, without giving too much away of the presentation on the day, um, I'm going to be looking at uh, the shape of the recovery. We are now in a recovery period, so what will that look like? Who will be the winners from this recovery? Who will be lagging uh, and why will they be lagging? I'll also be looking at geopolitics because for business now, geopolitics is very noisy, as we all know. So I'll be looking at protectionism, uh, globalization, uh, China, US relations, and, what, and again, all, all of what this means for, for business. OK, gosh, certainly a lot to go out there. Um, it goes without saying that we're living in unprecedented times for industry as a whole. Um, but as we all know, the non woven sector has in many ways leapt to the fore over the last 12 months. Um, what, in your view, are the key global trends currently impacting the non-woven sector as well as the sort of wider global business community? I think one trend for all businesses, uh, non-wovens and everywhere, is, is supply chain resilience and the pandemic has, has exposed just how vulnerable many supply chains are. Many supply chains are really long so uh, I yeah. think many businesses will not have end-to-end -end visibility over the complete uh, over their complete supply chain so that's one thing. Another is that many areas of business are now really politicised. Health, for example, clearly of great interest to Adana uh, members. Uh, food, for example, as well. Uh, technology, these, these are all really highly politicised. So how do businesses navigate the, this sort of very political um, environment? Also important, I think, are, and this is for all businesses, are the evolution of standards uh, in business. So. The world is splitting. Fragmentary tendencies are very strong, and this also, and this of course, means that governance also splits. So, what does that mean for business? Well, partly, of course, it pushes up costs, but it also businesses have to work out how to navigate this, how to navigate the uh, the geopolitics, and and geopolitics, of course, I think absolutely critical message that I will be giving all your members is that uh, you have to have your own corporate foreign policy these days. You have to be thinking. How do I navigate great power relations? How do I navigate protectionism? And this all comes down to thinking actively about foreign policy in, in the C-suite. OK, great. Thank you. Um, the view a couple of years ago was that the global economy was entering a sort of synchronised slowdown with a decade of slow growth aggravated by trade risk to come. Um, clearly, the pandemic has done very little to allay those fears. Um, would you say that that prediction is still valid for the 2020s? I think it is. I mean, clearly, the over the short term, the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic is going to be distorting. So last year we had the worst uh, recession since the 1930s globally for the UK, the worst since the 1700s, I think it was. You will get a bounce back because the bigger the ball, the, the further the, fall, the ball falls, the higher it will bounce as it goes up. So, well, there'll be a lot of noise around data in the short term. 
but that that will be i think just a, an evening out of, of the downturn with, with 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 quite bouncy numbers this year if you look further out though i think the trends are for sort of fair growth not as exciting as we had in the early 2000s of course but but fair but there will be headwinds and the, and among the headwinds will be the the structural deceleration of china uh, China is is maturing now. Its economy really can't grow as fast as the government says it can. The government wants 5% plus. That's going to be quite difficult, particularly given China's problems of demography, its ageing, uh, debt, uh, structural issues in the economy as well. So I think there'll be a lot, quite a lot of pressure downwards on growth. So uh, after we get over this, we, we, will, we will get into sort of fairer sort of calmer waters but but let's not get overexcited about the pace of growth because of these these big structural headwinds also i think in the eu obviously great of great interest to adana the the big concern there will be the differing rates of recovery so some bits of the eu will be recovering faster than others and that will of course aggravate existing concerns existing vulnerabilities within the eurozone in particular okay so Geopolitics is obviously an inescapable influence at the moment. Um, how, though, do you see the changing situation in the US uh, sort of following the election of President Biden and how that affects the West relationship with China? So I think before Biden's uh, inauguration, there was some so sort of hope among some that this would that his appearance would usher in a, an era of smoother relations with China. But my view is always that that actually that's a bit that's a bit too optimistic. There is bipartisan consensus in the US around China as a threat to to the US. That is that that goes right across the board politically in the US. So while I think you'll see some change in tone uh, of Biden with regards to China, I think in terms of substance, the US, uh, the new administration will, will still be pretty hard line towards China in areas where it where it thinks there is a threat. Look, for example, at Biden's um, review of supply chain security in the US. I think within the next 100 days, he wants critical supply chain vulnerability to be looked at and a report back to him for further action. Now, that is straight out of the Trump playbook. But of course, the tone is quite difficult. So d different rather. So there will be, um, I think, continued hard line from the US to China, but the tone will be different. I think importantly, one last point on this, the importantly is, there will, will Biden be looking for areas to cooperate with China? So one area could be climate change, for example. This is important for Biden politically. Another area could be health. We've seen that many of the problems globally now are transnational. So where there is a possibility, um, perhaps Biden will, will, will try to sort of reach out an olive branch to, uh, to Xi Jinping. But I wouldn't count your chickens on that one. Right. OK. Um, so looking at China, and um, they're continuing to close the gap technology wise and, and with the one belt, one road policy sort of showing little sign of slowing down. Um, what else, Robert, in your view, can we expect to see from China over the next few, five years? So Xi Jinping had a great year last year. I mean, the, the virus originated in, in Wuhan, one, one, one suspects. Um, and after an, an initial uh, sort of difficult start, um, China did, he, in his portrayal, did pretty well. So they got the virus under control and China was one of the only, was the only large economy that actually grew last year. So for Xi Jinping, this sort of validates his view of the superiority of the Chinese model. Um, very important for him, of course, as he goes into this year, because in mid-2021 uh, is the 100th anniversary of the of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. So 2021 for him has to be a year of triumph and all the, the narrative that he's giving sort of point to that. I think very importantly, China also spots, uh, Xi Jinping spots a, a, a unique window of opportunity um, with particularly given the disarray as he sees it in the West to, to really push China's interests forward. So you see it in vaccine diplomacy, for example, yeah. you see it in the wolf warriors, um, you see it in China's grey zone needling in the South China Sea, uh, around Japan, cyber attacks, all of that. So Xi Jinping is really sort of pushing um, China outward as far as he can. This is a great sort of moment of, of strategic opportunity uh, for China. However, before we all get sort of worried about uh, the, the fact that China is going to take over the world, China does have you know, really quite severe economic headwinds. Uh, one of those, as I mentioned earlier, is, is debt. 
Um, the economy, particularly when things get a bit tough, it tends to use debt. Government uses debt to get things going again, going again and China's debt levels are very high. Another is um, the demography. Um, China has an aging population. The labor force is now falling. These will all sort of prevent uh, more rapid uh, growth. But for China as well, for Xi Jinping, of course, the really important thing this year um, is for the narrative of triumph. Um, the government expects GDP to be growing about 5% a year going forward. But I think that's going to be difficult given how um, how the economy is maturing and, and how actually the economy should perhaps not be growing so quickly given where it is on the development cycle. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so if we look at the non-woven sector a little bit more specifically, um, if we take the trade tensions across the globe, add in the political fragmentation that we're seeing in Europe following Brexit, uh, the impact of coronavirus on national economies, um, is there a risk that key policies such as the European Union single-use plastics directive, for example, um, may lose their momentum? Well, on that particular, on the plastics directive, I think that's that's in place now and, and there seems to be um, quite a lot of political consensus around around plastics and the need to move away sort of to de-plasticize uh, the world. Um, I think that's that's um, that's probably set. Um, I think less certain is the green recovery that uh, that we that many of us have been hoping for after the pandemic. Um, if you look, for example, at the UK's uh, recent budget announcement, there wasn't really much, if anything, um, about green policy in the, in the budget announcement. And that despite, of course, the UK hosting COP26 at the end of, uh, the end of this year. If you look at uh, China's uh, new uh, five-year plan, for example, again, there wasn't much about green, uh, green policies, uh, notwithstanding the fact that China, Xi Jinping has promised to uh, make China carbon neutral by 2060. Um, if you look at Japan's policies, again, uh, the government there has promised to make Japan carbon neutral by 2050. And, and again, there's not much in the way of sort of concrete policies to, to sort of point towards it actually achieving that. So I think in the short term, the government policy will be will be um, directed largely at a recovery from the pandemic because the scarring from the pandemic, the the scars left will will be pretty severe. Even though you have good growth rates um, in aggregate, uh, many bits of the population, many bits of the economy will be struggling for many years to come. Right. Okay. Um, so just to wrap things up, Robert, and there's clearly a number of issues for um, industry to address. Um, but would you say that these threats also represent some opportunities? Well, I think uh, the, the main thing about the COVID-19 pandemic is it's catalyzed change. It hasn't really ushered in new things, but things that would have taken perhaps 10 years uh, to happen have happened um, over the space of, of 12 months. Mm -hmm. And one key one, particularly for your um, for the Adana members, um, is around the, the transition to the, to the digital world. Um, of course, this throws up challenges, as, as, as we'll see, over governance and security of supply chains and, and all of that. But it also throws up opportunities, I think. So the cust your customers are, are still there, but where they are uh, may have changed and how they consume uh, may have changed as well. But you see, I suppose the, the thing to think about is what is the impact of this, uh, the acceleration of digital business in an ageing, but increasingly, for example, digi digitally literate uh, population, for example. Um, and, and of course, despite geopolitical uh, so upheavals, there's sort of a second point here, despite uh, geopolitical upheavals, there's been no change to the, to the importance of certain markets. China will still be at some point, one of the, the world's largest economy, for example, it will have a lot of consumers that need yeah. the sort of things that, uh, yeah. that Idana members are, are making. Um, there's been no let up as, as well in the, in, in the transition towards greater urbanization in emerging markets, which, of course, is another important accelerator for consumption of the sorts of things that uh, Idana, Idana, Idana members will, will be making. So there are lots of opportunities, but I think the challenge for business is to think, is to sort of accelerate thinking, because some of the changes that, uh, that business may have thought would be five, ten years down the line are actually uh, with us now. Sure. OK. Well, um, thank you very much for that, Robert. Um, I think that sort of wraps things up for today. Uh, we don't want to give too much away before the conference. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, to hear more from Robert on these key topics, as well as other presentations and panel discussions, um, you can go to adana.org and you can sign up and ready stuff for Outlook there. So uh, thanks again, Robert, and I look forward to seeing you again in April.
Thank you. Bye-bye.